part of the Albany County Cornell Cooperative Extension as a Master Gardener volunteer. And I know there are people joining us from all over. So I want to explain that, um, first of all, Albany, New York and Albany County, um, we are located on the eastern edge of New York State, about halfway up. Um, if you look at a map and you look at the southwestern border of uh, Vermont and the northwestern border of Massachusetts, where those meet, if you go in just a little bit west, that's us on the Hudson River. And I have a picture behind me, which is really not too much what it looks like here right now. The uh, trees are not in leaf. However, most of our grass is still green. We've had a really absolutely strange winter, hardly any snow. Uh, today it was 60 in the middle of February, where we usually have cold and snow. So I don't know what to say. Um, the other thing is wherever you live, whatever county in whatever state, it is likely that you have a cooperative extension. And generally it's tied in with your land grant college. So here it's Cornell, uh, Vermont, it's UVM, um, it's Rutgers in New Jersey, et cetera. So you can get very good information from your local cooperative extension um, that will be uh, local to you. I have designed this, I used Albany as a base um, because I certainly couldn't do the whole country or even the whole state. So I will um, tell you as we go along how you can do your own research and find the information you need. Okay, awakening the garden in spring. So um, Rosemary's already spoken about this and I am preaching to people who already know this, but climate change is here. You see it on the news all the time, things that are happening in various extremes throughout the country and the world. So we really have to pay attention to that as we work in our gardens, as we plan our gardens and how we take care of them. So this was on the news just a couple of days ago, so I thought I'd put it in here. This is just one example. In 1988, the Great Salt Lake in Utah looked like it does on the left. In 2021, it already had lost um, quite a bit of its water. And of course, there's salt around the edges now, and it's just going to get worse. Um, so what we need to do when we're looking at our gardens and the environment, um, look at the phenology. And that's a word, if you don't know that it's a great word. Uh, I was an English teacher. Um, it's the study of periodic biological phenomena that are correlated with climatic conditions. And in other words, it means taking cues from nature. I remember my mother teaching me things about this. So you notice when the plants bloom, when the pussy willows come out in bud, uh, when the forsythia comes out, when the birds arrive that have migrated, uh, animals leaving their winter dens, um, all of those things are cues from nature and they know what they're doing. So you don't have to look at some kind of a graph to see when spring is coming and that's going to change as we go through the years. Also adapt, grow with the flow. So when climate change is coming along, pay attention to your USDA zone. Um, changes are going to come along in that. We're zone five in the Albany area. And actually it's broken into two parts now through much of the country. So 5A, lower numbers are colder, lower letters are colder. 5A is up in our mountainous areas. 5B is down in the Hudson Valley. So there are even differences within zone five. Make sure you're putting the right plant in the right place and make sure you're using less water. We'll talk about getting rid of the lawn later on. Uh, not getting rid of it completely, but shrinking it a bit. Um, xeriscaping, that's another great word. Xeriscaping means using plants that use up less water. They call those xeric plants. And there are quite a few of them that are beautiful. You don't have to use cactus. And of course, eat local foods whenever possible. Let's not have the trucking going on now up here, of course, we grow virtually nothing in the winter. So we have to truck in our vegetables. Mitigate, so um, not just adapting to climate change, but mitigating the effects of it. So good garden um, practices can help rebalance the carbon cycle. Minimize your carbon emitting inputs, lawn mowers, even leaf blowers, things like that. 
feed the soil, not the plant, feed deep into the soil, use non-synthetic fertilizers, avoid pesticide use, use xeric plants that require less water, and mulch to conserve water and eliminate weeds. And of course, you know, mulch, mulch helps keep the uh, roots of the plants cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. Eliminate pesticides. And these are two of the many signs that you can buy. Um, you should be an educator to your neighbors. So if you have a pesticide free zone and are using no pesticides, that's something to advertise. Now, plan. That's the first thing we're going to talk about before you get out in a garden. Plan your gardens on paper or on your computer. So there are some great design, landscape design plans that you can get on your computer. Um, we have existing on wildones.com, we have existing designs from different areas that you can look at and adapt or use. Um, also, you can take, I just take graph paper and I just do kind of a, a quick uh, design of my island garden, um, my other garden in the back that's a little bit more linear. Um, and that just gives me an idea of what I'm going to be doing. Keep records with a journal and photos. So here's a journal. Um, this is sort of like the one I use. Um, what I do is I take pictures, I make notes, but I also, it's in a binder. So I have those plastic sleeves and I print out a description of the plant and its care. Um, I particularly like the Missouri Botanical Garden. They have good descriptions of different plants. And then I slip the tag into that sleeve. And it's really important to keep your tags. People call us all the time on our hotline to get advice. They don't know what the name of their plant. They don't know what the care in terms of sun or water or fertilizer should be. So keep those tags. Now, the other thing I'm going to touch on is just vegetable gardening. If you um, do some edible landscaping, look to the top left here and you see some squash and the beautiful blooms and somebody harvested some and they're in a bucket. Um, over to the right, you have some kale. Uh, down at the bottom, you have some marigolds and then there are tomatoes in there and marigolds take good care of tomatoes. They're, um, uh, they manage the pests, um, keep the pests away. And also the point of this is if you have a lovely pollinator garden with native plants, then you're going to attract all of these pollinators in terms of insects and birds that will pollinate your vegetables, your vegetable flowers, and they'll be even better than ever. You'll have a bigger crop and a better crop. So here's another picture. This is uh, cherry tomatoes and some herbs in a container. So if you're living in a place where you just have a patio or a balcony, you still can grow vegetables. So they aren't native plants. Uh, there are only a few that are native plants and only a few like rhubarb, rhubarb excuse me, and asparagus that are perennial. Most of them are annual, but it's something to add in to your native gardens. And remember we're wild ones, so we're talking natives. Now, this for people in the Albany area, the Albany County, Cornell Garden-Based Learning, Learn, Garden, Reflect, um, that will take you to garden guidance. And then in that, you can find a selected list of vegetable varieties for gardeners in New York State. Uh, 2023 is just coming out. And in that, they give you um, a whole list of vegetables that have been trialed in New York State and what they are good for. So I don't know if I have, I don't have tomatoes here, that's too bad. But the tomatoes, every single plant will tell you, um, it'll say after it, for example, the asparagus says F and R after it. And that means it's resistant to fusarium and it's resistant to rust. So for the tomatoes, it will say those that are resistant to late blight and it will give you everything from grape size to the beautiful beefsteak ones. So it's, it's a great resource for vegetable gardeners. Okay, herbs. Most of our herbs are not um, native either, but herbs like full sun, they prefer lean and somewhat dry soil. So if you're putting them, uh, you're either starting them or you're putting them in containers, a soilless potting mix is good, not a heavy potting mix. And you can grow them in containers, of course. 
Now, we're still planning. So plan for native plants in terms of perennials, shrubs, ground covers. You might even look at trees. Um, you need to remove the invasives, replace them with natives, add natives to your existing gardens. So what I mean is you might have an invasive area and you replace with natives. Also, you might have a perennial garden and you add natives to that. You don't need to rip it out. You simply add natives to it as you go along. Um, edge your gardens neatly. So that's very important. Um, I have a front island that is a native garden and it could look really blousy, but I make sure it had a little stone wall in the front of it, which is excellent. And I also edge it really well. So it looks um, like it's intentional. They know that this is my garden, that I want to be there, that I want them to enjoy, rather than having it look like something where I didn't take care of it and all this stuff just grew up. Here's a picture at Dawn's um, Wild Things, the Wild Things Rescue Nursery. And that is in Rensselaer County, New York, right next to Albany County. It's up in um, Hoosick Valley and she grows only native plants. And this looks to me like it's uh, either woodland flocks or wild blue flocks. And look at how beautiful that is in the shade. Just to tempt you a little bit. So here's some native plant information. In New York State, they have the Devar De Department, speak much? Department of Environmental Conservation prohibited and regulated invasive plants. So we have a lot of invasive plants that have come in. We also have native flowers, grasses, shrubs, trees, and vines. Um, through Cornell College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Invasive Ornamental Plant Alternatives. Now what's happened is uh, some of the shrubs and other plants that have been planted in landscapes by the people who develop the area, they turn out, it turns out that they are ornamental, which means they do nothing. They don't attract pollinators. They don't attract insects because you don't want insects on your ornamental plants, right? So they've put those things in. And then there are other plants, of course, that you know have simply become invasive. There's also something called the New York Floral Atlas. And that will tell you, uh, if you look at a particular county, what natives have been found in that county. Wonderful. And for people who are not in New York State, I would say, do some research and find out if you have something similar to what I've listed above. Now, the other thing that I recommend, there is a YouTube video called The Uninvited, The Spread of Invasive Species. It's fascinating for anybody. Um, it's specific to New York State, but a lot of places have the same kinds of invasives that came in through rivers and lakes. And um, this tells, it shows all of these wonderful people taking out different things. It shows that um, the spotted lanternfly in New York State, they're afraid of that with the wine, the grape crops. And so they're actually stopping trucks on the highways, sending a, dro a drone up over the top of it to look for any, any masses of, of um, what am I trying to say, of, of different, uh, not seeds, but good grief. I'll get back to that. But they're looking for um, the spread of those um, spotted lantern flies. They don't want them coming into, the, uh, into our, uh, our state if they can help it. And they're doing that kind of work with a lot of things, a lot of uh, plants that grow in lakes, milfoil, that sort of thing. Egg masses is what I was trying to say, honestly. <laughs> okay, now we rely a lot on Doug Tallamy and I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's an entomologist out of the University of Delaware and he has written four books so far, and he is really big on native plants. He feels that we should be um, planting pollinator plants, uh, plants that, that feed birds, that have lots of caterpillars, that sort of thing in our own yards so that we become a homegrown national park. We're like a big national park where all the birds can fly through when they migrate, have a place to rest, a place to eat and drink. And in his book, Nature's Best Hope, that's where he proposes that. His first book he wrote with Rick Dark, another professor, called The Living Landscape. And what I like about that is in the back, there are charts 
of all different plants, where you can grow them and what um, they serve, um, birds or um, hummingbirds or butterflies or whatever it is. Bringing nature home was the second one, how you can sustain wildlife with native plants. I spoke of nature's best hope. And then his most recent one is the nature of oaks. And he feels that the white oak, which can support about a hundred different species of caterpillars is the greatest thing for birds. When birds come through, we're feeding them seeds in the winter just to keep them, you know, keep them going. But what they want to feed their young are big, juicy, fatty, protein-filled caterpillars. So that's what we really need to have available to our, to our birds. Here's something else I found in the De um, Department of Environmental Conservation in New York State. Um, I do have the link down at the bottom and it gives you a list of many, many different uh, native flowers, shrubs, trees, vines. And there's a picture of the New York Floral at Flora Atlas. And I usually just go to this map and I know that little green triangle is Schenectady County and we're right below that. So I click on that and that will take me to my, um, to the whole list of plants. Then I go over, I've chosen Albany County. I go over and choose yes, on native. So all of the plants that they're going to show me have been found in Albany County. And you can look at it by the botanical name. I'm big on botanical names because sometimes the common name can be for a number of different plants that aren't related. So if you know the botanical name, you've got it, but you can go over and click common name and look, look for this alphabetically through the common name of whatever plant it is. Then again, you'll see if it's uh, native in your county and um, if it's got a picture of it for you, there'll be the picture of the little camera there. And again, it behooves you to find out what information you have in your own state. Okay. Some suggestions, spring blooming natives. These are things you might put in your landscape. We're still planning. We're planning what we're going to put in. Wild columbine, the wild blue phlox, and then an allium. There's one kind of allium that is native. Um, a sleepy catchfly, never heard of that. Heard of Silene, but I hadn't heard it by the other name. Um, the azaleas and rhododendrons, quite a few of those are natives. So these are ideas of what you might put in. Now, by the way, these are, I call it a perennial. Wild columbine, it looks like it's an annual because it kind of disappears and it doesn't come up again from the base the way a lot of perennials do, but it sets seed. It drops its seeds and then you'll have more wild columbines there. So that's why, that's how it exists as a native and reproduces itself even though the mother plant dies. Here's some of that wild blue phlox, and here's the wild columbine, which tends to be red. Beautiful stuff. Now here we have a garden in the woods in Framingham, Mass. So if you live anywhere around in the Northeast, this is a great place to go in the spring. If you look on the left, that's actually an azalea. They have some very old, old azaleas and rhododendrons, as well as some other plants. But this is an unusual color for an azalea. They also have plant sales. But you are literally walking through the woods, looking at all of these beautiful natives. So here are some summer blooming. And of course, in any garden, you want to have um, succession. You want to have things blooming all the time. So here's the wild bergamot, which I love. Um, it is a, a, a lavender color, a, a pale lavender, it's lovely. And of course, it's related to the other bee bombs, but uh, most of those are not native to our area at least. So here's a list of what you might choose to plant. Butterfly weed, Asclepius, um, re, uh, related to milkweed. The other thing is butterfly bush. I have people say to me, that's such a beautiful shrub and it attracts so many butterflies. I see them all over it. Well, it's like attracting young children to a big bowl of candy. They get very little nutrition from that. It attracts them, but really it's not good for them at all. And here, by the way, are um, some shrubs, New Jersey tea, 
um, the story about this is that the British, when they were on the Delaware, they ran out of tea and they used this shrub to make tea from, and obviously it didn't poison them. So it must've been okay. Now here are some examples. There's the wild bergamot that I love, butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa, New Jersey tea and flower, and then it also gets berries. And then here's another one, the nine bark, which also has beautiful bark. All of these are um, natives, and there's the flower for, or the, excuse me, the berries for that. And then fall blooming natives, goldenrod. I took a trip down to the New York Botanical Garden. That was the first time I saw goldenrod planted in a garden. Most of us find goldenrod by the side of the roads and fields, that sort of thing, but actually it can be a very attractive plant. It is not the same as ragweed. Ragweed has pollen that goes out through the air and that's why um, people are allergic to it. But goldenrod is not the same and the pollen doesn't travel the same way. It travels on insects and birds. And here are some others. I love white turtle head. That's a really pretty plant and it likes it wet. And of course, the American witch hazel. That's one of them that looks really pretty in the fall with blooms. So there's the white turtle head. There's the witch hazel. And sumac. So I really love sumac. And I, until our president, Rosemary Mix, made some, I had never had sumac tea. You can have sumac tea uh, either hot or cold. She made iced tea. It was delicious. It's very lemony. It's very tart and lemony. And some people call it sumac lemonade. It doesn't taste exactly like it, but it's very ref refreshing. And of course, there's, there are the seeds. Those look really pretty toward the end of the summer. Here's some fall color. So that's something I'm adding to my landscape this year to replace the forsythia I took down. Okay, now locally, this is where we can order or buy plants and then pick them up. Um, there are places that will sell native plants online. So Helia is one near us in West Stockbridge. Um, we are on the border with Massachusetts. Um, Wild Things Rescue Nursery, um, she advises you to order soon so she knows what to have. Uh, Catskill Native Nursery, and then Nasami. Now that is the other part of the Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts. That's in Waitley, which is north of Northampton and Amherst. So that's a really great place too. To purchase seeds, of course, which you can do online, I particularly like the Wild Seed Project in Maine. So you need to look at uh, what will grow in your area, what you need, and then you can go to this um, link. And by the way, the handout was there I think when you signed in, when you, when you found the link to this presentation. And the reason it's great for you to have my handout on your computer is you can use all of these. These are live links, so you can use them all. Um, and Wild Seed Project has a lot of different, it's out of Maine, a lot of different wonderful seeds, all natives, and they, they harvest them themselves. Hudson Valley Seed Company, Vermont Wildflower, whoop, didn't mean to do that. See if I can get myself back here. Um, Wildflower Farm, True Leaf Market, Seed Saver Exchange, and then of course Park Seed, Burpee, and the others that are very famous. You know, they will have some natives as well. They aren't all native. Um, and I did find by accident, by the way, that if I click on my PowerPoint, if I click on the link, it will go to the site. Okay. Um, starting seeds indoors is a great idea. And now is a good time to start. Um, get these things growing quickly. You can have, here's one flat of tomatoes under one light. Here, somebody has saved all of these different plastic clamshell types of things. You can put holes in the bottom and use those. You definitely want something where the light can get in. Here's something that looks like what I have now. And my husband and I put this together. We just bought some shelves that have kind of they don't have solid shelves on the bottom. They have sort of crisscross. That way we can use S hooks and chains to hang the lights. And the lights are regular, just regular fluorescent lights. You don't need special lights. Broad spectrum is fine. 
and then flats here. And then eventually I um, put these in separate little pots. And then gradually as they get bigger, they go into bigger containers. So gardening, uh, if you go to ccealbany.com, they have a great piece on um, starting seeds, anybody can access that. It doesn't matter what state you're in, it's basically all the same information. So gardening, under food gardening, back sheets, there's an indoor vegetable seed starting sheet, which of course you can use for native plants and flowers as well. The other thing that we tried, and Rosemary and Christy, I did this um, as well. Rosemary and, and another woman, Jan and I got together and we did some winter sowing, which is really easier than it looks. And if you've heard of that, you know that you just save these plastic milk containers, cut them in half horizontally, put soil and seeds in there, put holes in the bottom and in the top, make sure you label them and you water them slightly. And then the top should be open for water. What I did was um, we were concerned about little mice and things falling in, not being able to get out. So what I did was I took those onion bags that are mesh, any kind of mesh, and I just cut out a piece of it and put it on with a rubber band. So the water and the air can get in there, but the critters can't. And here we have a crop in the spring. Tools, time to check your tools. So check them, tune up garden and lawn machinery. I've been using more and more a wonderful reel-to-reel -reel mechanical mower. And as my lawn gets smaller, I'll be using it more and more. But, but check and tune up your machinery, clean and sharpen your hand tools, hire help if you need it, and dispose of old garden chemicals. And many different counties in the country have a hazardous waste day. Now, after all that, time to get out in the garden. So you can see how important the planning is. And now is the time to be planning. First of all, before you walk out in the garden, we have ticks aplenty here, as we do in most of the Northeast. And the picture here is very edifying. This is the size of what you expect a tick to be, which is pretty darn small. But the wood ticks can actually be like a poppy seed. So you really need to be careful. I have had, I had anaplasmosis. I didn't, I haven't had Lyme disease. Anaplasmosis is worse if you don't catch it right away. The good news is unlike Lyme disease, it comes on really quickly. Comes on, I had it by the next morning after I had been out in the yard. Um, didn't have any evidence of a tick or anything, but I was very, very sick. So um, if you catch it early, they, they give you a lot of um, doxycycline and that sort of antibiotic and that's it and it's over. And I haven't gotten it since. Um, but when you go outside, we like to go out in shorts and sleeveless t-shirts, but really wear light clothes, long sleeves, long pants without cuffs, and socks, light colored socks. So you can see them if they're on you. Spray your clothes with a tick repellent containing DEET. And of course, now you can buy shirts and pants that have DEET embedded and space for many, many washings. I wouldn't put DEET on my skin, but you put it on your clothes. And then when you get in, check your native self in the mirror, use a mirror to look behind you, look in all the naughty places and under your arms and things. And this is serious stuff. If you find a tick, do not squeeze it to take it off because then it might just put whatever it has in it into you if it hasn't done already. So using a pair of tweezers, or a special tick remover, which you can usually get at the, the vet, um, kind of get under the mouth part, turn it a little bit and pull it out. And what I would do is I have a dedicated glass, little glass jar, and I put the tick in the jar. And that way, if you have the rash or if you become ill, you can take that to the doctor and they can do a test on it and see what it might have given you. Now, out into the garden, don't walk on wet soil. You're going to compress the soil. This is a bit of an exaggeration. It's a rice paddy in Vietnam, but the idea is you need to wait until you have workable soil 
do not let anybody drive on your soil ever actually, but in the, in the spring when it's wet is the worst. So even walking around, having somebody use a, a mower or any kind of machine on it, it's going to compact the soil. So what you wanna do is you go out and you pick up or dig up about a half a cup of soil and put it in your hand. Squeeze the soil together into a ball, hold it for a couple of seconds, let it go. If it can be shattered by dropping it or pressing it with your fingers and it just kind of falls apart, that's great. It's nice workable, friable soil. If it keeps its shape or breaks only with difficulty in solid sections rather than loose soil, it still contains too much water. You have to have your soil uh, have water that flows through it and it needs a lot of air in it. It needs air spaces. And if it's full of water, it doesn't have the air. Now it's time to clean out your gardens. We're really getting to, into this in our area. If necessary, rake out the leaves that you have left on your garden last fall after seven consecutive days have been consistently above 50 degrees. It was 60 today, but we're, we're not gonna get that consistently. It's gonna get cold again, but anyway. <clears throat> so it's a good idea, and this is for putting the garden to bed in the, in the fall actually, to leave your leaves on the gardens. And I'll tell you in a, on a slide when to remove them, but you don't always have to remove the leaves. They make good mulch. Remove and compost any annual plants you might have. And there's a link there to spring garden cleanup done right. Cut back your perennials to 12 to 18 inches when you see green growth at the bottom. So what we're saying is in the fall, you should leave the stems up because the stems um, harbor quite a number of beneficial insects and caterpillars. So we found that cutting your, your uh, perennial sticks back, you, uh, many of them are hollow, cutting them back in the fall, you're just getting rid of a lot of beneficial insects that you could leave. So in the spring, you can take the cut stems, gather them into small bundles of a few dozen each, tie them together with a piece of twine and hang them on a fence or lean them against a tree on an angle. And what will happen is the insects that are still inside them will emerge when they're ready. The other thing is more insects, especially native bees, will move into the stems and possibly use them as brood chambers all summer long. So you make them look nice and you just tie them up, up against a tree or if you have a fence or something. And then the other thing you do with your gardens is you rake out any dead plants, get rid of any diseased plants. That's really important. Don't let them fall down there if they're diseased. Now, the benefits of leaving leaves on your garden, it adds organic matter to the soil. It stops weeds, it acts as a mulch, and it feeds worms and soil bacteria. Now, when should I rake the leaves off my garden in the spring? Well, when the leaf layers are thicker than two to three inches, you wanna rake them off because that's going to keep other things from coming up, keeping your uh, other plants from coming up. If, when large leaves have formed a thick matted layer, you want those off. When leaves are covering your flowers or plants, or if leaves are close to a tree or flower stems, you know even with mulch, you don't want it up against the stem of the plant. So I know this house, this is not my house, but one of the things to do is to consider reducing your lawn. Um, we just had a talk at the Master Gardener meeting today on shrinking your lawn. Honey, I shrunk the lawn. Um, the idea is, and Doug Tallamy says this, Lawns are the largest irrigated crop in the United States. And most lawns have no benefit. People take out their broadleaf to what they call weeds. They take out their clover, they take out their dandelions, um, flowers that early pollinators can use. Just not a ben beneficial crop. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And most lawns are a monoculture. Most people plant exactly the same plant through whatever acreage they have in their yard. So the American lawn is the best illustration of unsustainable practices. 
it's a monoculture, it's a biological desert. Um, we talk about uh, ecosystem services, what the ecosystem does for you and for plants and animals and in insects. And so the lawn, there are no ecological services. The largest irrigated crop in the United States, as I said, it contributes to stormwater runoff just the way it's constructed, it uses huge amounts of fossil fuels to mow. Mowing machines give off CO2, and it requires many chemical pollutants and toxins to keep it the way people think they want, want it to be. I have a master gardener friend who lives in a, um, in a condo area, and they are not allowed to have broad-leafed plants in their lawn. Since she won't use any kind of an herbicide, she's on her hands and knees pulling them out every spring. My answer is, I wouldn't live there. I, I don't understand that. Um, one of our missions, I think, will be going, to di going into different homeowners associations and maybe bringing them into the 21st century when it comes to um, landscaping. Now, this looks like a myth, but I'll tell you, I discovered this house in a development last fall. And I just went to look at it again yesterday. It's a little bit neater now. But what the people have done, can't wait to see it in the spring. They have taken their front lawn and they have made nicely edged paths through gardens. So they have gardens in the front. They have island gardens. The gardens go all the way down the side of their house. They have trees and shrubs and plants. And I will be adding pictures in the spring with their permission um, to, my, uh, to my presentation, because this is going to be absolutely gorgeous. Just enough lawn to walk through and enjoy the gardens. Now in my backyard, I have a flat area and I'm leaving that lawn because my grandkids like to play there. My grandkids are um, not quite teenagers yet, but they like to, to play sports and things there. So there's no reason you have to remove all of your lawn. It's just shrink the lawn and uh, make more native plants available to our, uh, to our wildlife. Now here are some great ground covers. Canadian wild ginger, wild white violet, I'll show you pictures of some of these, sweet woodruff, partridge berry, and carex, Pennsylvania carex. Um, the person who gave us the talk, Master Gardener, who gave us the talk on Honey, I Shrunk the Lawn, who particularly loves the Carex. They're natives, you know, many of them are natives. There are so many different um, kinds of them, but many of them are natives and um, they're great. Talk about a no-mow lawn. All of these are no-mow lawns because you're doing, using a ground cover instead. Now, Pachysandra that we all love is not nor is Vinca. However, there is a native Pachysandra. It just doesn't look like the, the Asian one that we plant. So here, Canadian wild ginger. I absolutely love this stuff. I too use it around trees. It's really lovely. There's a European one that's shinier, but that is not native. The wild white violet, I tried to get rid of this for years. And all of a sudden in the back of my pea-sized brain came the thought, why am I doing that? It looks really pretty. It's a very pretty ground cover. So I'm leaving it. It has the white violets in the spring, and then it has the leaves until fairly late in the fall, but it is herbaceous. But they'll be right back again in the spring. Pennsylvania Carex. Here's this at a modern house. I think that's very interesting. It looks kind of fluffy. It's not a, a very low growing grass. It's probably six to eight inches tall. And then over here, I've fallen in love with this. I saw this at someone's house. Partridge berry, which actually gets little tiny flowers and little tiny berries, which the birds love, very low to the ground. It's basically a vine that grows across the, vine, the ground. And it's, it's very small. The leaves are um, oh, smaller than a dime. And then another one that uh, Judith Federley, Honey, I Shrunk the Lawn, loves. This is the wild strawberry. It's native around here. And this is what it looks like in flower on the upper left. And then on the right, a close-up of those flowers. 
and then it actually gets small strawberries, which are absolutely delicious. They support the birds as well. So you kind of, it's like with blueberries, you kind of have to get out there fast and beat the birds to it. Leave some for them, take some for you. What a wonderful ground cover. Put out signs to explain what you're doing. This really helps. So if you are not going to mow your grass until later, so you're going to let the dandelions and the clover and whatever else shows up be there, but your lawn's gonna be longer, put up a sign so that people know that you're doing this intentionally. You haven't moved out of the house and abandoned it. Pollinator garden, uh, you can just put work in progress, whatever it is, leave the leaves in the fall, pesticide free. Um, many of these you can order online. And I think we're going to make some for our chapter and make some really nice ones out of slate. Um, Christy can maybe explain that later. <clears throat> soil. I talked about too much water in the soil. That picture of the soil is really nice. That's really nice soil. Okay, good soil has macroscopic organisms and microscopic organisms, bigger and smaller. It also has pockets for air, water, and drainage. So I have in one area of my yard, clay that you could make sculptures out of. So what you do with that, by the way, um, I can't talk about absolutely everything in this, but when you amend the soil, um, I do talk about that a little bit. When you amend the soil, you can add in granite grit, which is also called poultry grit. So it's fine granite, but it's not super fine like sand. If you add sand to clay, you've got cement. But um, if you add that in, along with some good or organics like chopped leaves and compost and that sort of thing, mix them in, then you're gonna open up that clay soil. And that's what it needs. There's no room for air in that. And so if you open it up by amending with granite grit and um, organic materials, I've been doing that slowly throughout the years. Test for pH, your local, um, maybe a garden center, but also your, your local cooperative extension should be able to test for pH. There are home tests that you can use as well. Um, what we found is we actually get trained in doing this and matching those colors and we get tested on it. And so we're really good at testing for pH, but you need to know the acidity or lack thereof of your soil. Um, if it's acid, um, uh, something that likes it neutral or base simply won't be able to take up any nutrients and vice versa. Rhododendrons and azaleas like it a little bit more acid. And so that's chemical, that's important. And um, you can fertilize all you want, but if the acidity isn't right, if the pH isn't right, then your nutrients are just going to be wasted. So how do you treat your soil? Well, fertilize it naturally. So mudu, uh, anything that's herbivore. So mudu, horse manure, that sort of thing. Till it as little as possible. Back in the day, we brought in rototillers. Now they say till as little as possible because when you till, you're destroying the layers that should be there. Grow lots of different plants, diversity. Add organic matter to sand or clay. And I also mentioned granite grit, I should have it here. And eliminate or limit pesticides. Um, once in a while, if you have a bumper crop of poison ivy, for example, you may have to eradicate it with pesticides. It's rare, but it could be dangerous to people. So feed the soil. I mentioned it earlier. Feed the soil, not the plants. So using chemical fertilizers, you know you can fill your, um, your watering can with um, dilute fertilizer, and you can just put it around the plant, and that will go down to the roots, but um, it's really feeding the plant, not the soil. And as you can see in this, organic matter and um, good fertilizers go all the way down. They support the microorganisms, they give the soil nutrients, they last for years. <clears throat> and then amend the soil. You can use the organic materials that include compost. So there's natural fertilizer like this cow here, what the cow produces, but also compost. If you can have a compost pile, I have one in the back because I have the room, 
uh, put in the yard waste, fallen leaves, grass clippings, as long as nothing's diseased or nothing has herbicide on it, weeds, garden plants. So all of those can be chopped up a bit and used as compost. Let them decay. It's even better when you let them decay. And your compost pile or um, whatever you use as a container, kitchen scraps and coffee grounds. Now you can't use meat, fish, bones, or fatty foods like cheese and salad dressing, oils, that sort of thing. They simply are not going to biodegrade. What they're going to do is attract wildlife, the kind of wildlife you may not want. Now, I have a friend who worked for Maxwell House his whole life, and he said, if you want to use decaf coffee grounds, make sure they have been made decaffeinated by the Swiss water process. Anything else, they use uh, different chemicals, and you really don't want to put that decaf coffee on the grounds on, uh, into your compost. <clears throat> now, here are different types of containers. Here's one that's just kind of a pile. And you can see a good compost heap, pile, bin, whatever it is, will get hot. And it's supposed to do that. It gets hot, it biodegrades, it destroys the weed seeds, um, it destroys diseases. And then over here, you have somebody putting his kitchen bucket into this nice uh, box that he either made himself or he purchased. You can take um, chicken wire. Now they call it poultry netting. You can just make your own bin. And here you can buy one. I like this particularly because it's off the ground. It's got a handle because it's a good idea to turn your compost once in a while. It's going to need air and water and a little bit of sunlight. Um, I bought a bio orb, which is really cool. It's a big, like three feet in diameter orb. You open the top and you put in all the stuff. And then you're supposed to, to roll it around. I couldn't budge it. So I don't advise that. Now I just use it with the top open as if it's a bin like this. Um, really cute. And I was picturing the neighborhood boys pushing it around. Nope, you can't move it. And then to conserve water. Now we're early. We're not quite planting yet. Install soaker hoses. And that way you're watering at the base of the plants. Now some are just soakers. Others will spray up maybe four inches. And that's great. So you're not putting um, something else that's going to irrigate, irrigate up into the air. Now, if you have a dry spell, you might want to go out once in a while and just hose off the plants. Give them some water on their leaves and get the dust off. But generally speaking, a little soaker hose or um, a sprayer hose is enough along the ground. Now, Punxsutawney Phil, my husband's name is Phil, by the way. Um, so Punxsutawney Phil, um, we were really excited because he saw his shadow, which means six more weeks of winter. And if we could only have six more weeks of winter, we'd be glad. But anyway, but I'm sure a lot of you are in similar places. But anyway, you can look up your last frost dates. So for example, where we live, zone B is a bit warmer. April uh, 10th to 20th is when we expect the last frost. Um, the surrounding areas, um, which are uh, a little bit warmer, I put 5B again, that's supposed to be 5A, uh, up in the hill towns, up in the mountains, uh, May, but then um, the surrounding areas where you get away from the Hudson Valley a bit, but not up in the mountains, those are the dates. Now, of course, people from this area, we don't have the sound on, but they're probably saying, ha, huh, it depends, it really depends. And so anything that's very tender, which is not most native plants, really should wait till Memorial Day. So people are planting tomatoes and that sort of thing that are not native and are not hardy to this area, um, then you should wait later. But you can plant earlier when you have native plants because they're used to it. They're native, they grew here. But the last frost dates are good to know. So you should look those up in your area. And then you can go out after May 1st and divide and um, replant your perennials. So this person has what looks to me like a daylily um, and hostas and other non-natives are like that, but they're also uh, natives where you can go out. If they've gotten a little bit bigger than you like or you want to propagate, you want more of them, dig them up, divide them. You see a guy just kind of slamming shovel through there and that's what you can do. 
or you can use some kind of a knife, split them apart and replant them. But in this area, I can't be sure about other states, but in this area, you need to keep them in your own yard. Don't give them to your neighbors. Don't donate to them to a plant sale. Um, if you have taken them out of your own yard, because we have Asian jumping worms. They don't look like that, but I thought I'd scare you with it. Asian jumping worms look like that. Um, <clears throat> earthworms, by the way, are not native either, but um, they were brought in and they, they have turned out to be beneficial. They have a pink raised clitellum here. The Asian jumping worms, you can tell by the name that they were brought in as well, they have a white clitellum, which is even with the rest of the body, it's not raised up. But the way you're gonna know them is they're big, they're long. They may be about the same diameter as a regular earthworm, but they're long. And the problem with them is they jump around. They, um, if you try to pick one up and put it in a cup or something, it will wriggle around so much you can't hold on to it. So that's the reason they're called jumping. Um, they rapidly deplete the layer of organic matter on the forest floor, the layer that's so important, um, the layer that is so important for growth of native seedlings and wildflowers. And, you know, um, I think there's a problem in Michigan with these, Michigan or Minnesota, and they take out the, the roots of the saplings so there's no new growth in a forest. So it can use the for leave it barren, preventing forest regeneration and destroying valuable habitat for wildlife. They also release a lot of nutrients really fast. Native vegetation can't take up these nutrients fast enough and the forest loses the excess nutrients when it rains. They eat the roots of saplings, preventing new forest growth. They mature twice as fast as earthworms, reduce more quick, reproduce more quickly, are more aggressive, can exist at higher densities, they live together in a mass, can more quickly deplete forest leaf litter. So these things are not good. And that's why if you are giving someone else a perennial out of your garden, even a native plant, it could mean that they are in there, even if you rinse it off, that the little tiny ones are in there. So we're advising people not to do that. We're not using donated plants. Uh, the only donated plants are those started from seed in a pot, but no um, perennials dug out of the ground. Now, if you think you have them, I have, not, I have not seen one in my yard yet, but they are in Albany County. You can mix a gallon of water with a third of a cup of ground must, yellow mustard, the, you know, the powder, uh, clear a bare patch of soil and pour the solution slowly over the soil. This will drive any worms to the surface, including the, the earthworms we like. If you have jumping worms, report it to, in New York State, it's nyimapinvasives.org. And you should have an environmental conservation body in your state that you would report this to, because they do keep track of what counties these things are in. It's always something. There are presently no viable control methods for Asian jumping worms. So prevent the spread by not moving or giving away mulch, compost, or plants. And when purchasing plants, check for these. And generally, um, you purchase plants that are in pots. And, um, the, and if it's a, a grower, you know, that's a responsible grower, they'll know. Now, by the way, the only thing people can do about these, if you find them, put them in a plastic Ziploc bag and put them in the sun. Ick, but that's the only way to kill them. Now, and any tender plants you're gonna plant. So these will probably not be natives, but purchase plants or seedlings, um, vegetable plants, um, annuals, that sort of thing. In our area, again, after Memorial Day or Memorial Day weekend. So mulch, mulch keeps roots and bulbs warm or cool, helps retain the moisture and keeps the weeds at bay. So mulch is a very good thing. They say never leave bare soil. And then the last thing, house plants. House plants like a summer vacation too. And I hope you already do this, but you move out your house plants gradually. So you put them, no matter how much sun they like, you put them in the shade. 
And again, you do this after the last frost. Put them in the shade. After a while, put them in dappled shade and then move them to the sun. As a newbie, I moved my um, geraniums that I wintered over one year in pots out to the sun. They just fried. The leaves turned yellow. Um, not a good idea. So track when the nighttime temperatures are consistently in the 50s. And that's a good time to do that. And then I also, for those of you who don't know, this is the Cornell Cooperative Extension. This is Albany County. You go to gardening. A lot of information there. And this is Cornell um, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. They also have a lot of information there. You have a link to it. And that's it. No matter how long the winter, spring is sure to follow. We can only hope. So Christy, anybody have any questions for me? Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, Marty. And I'm going through the chat now. I see people have left some very um, interesting and wonderful um, links, which please look there and, and copy the ones that you'd like. Ooh. Um, well, unfortunately, I missed this one, Laura. It, it said that uh, Marty was cutting out. Um, it did oh. not. Happen. I know. I'm very sorry. I'm just looking at it now. Um, then we have a comment. Our garden is in zone five in the Catskills. We have a huge problem with barberry in invasive. It will oh, be a yeah. huge undertaking to get them out, but we want to take them out. Any advice on the best approach to getting rid of barberry? Um, I have to tell you, I they decided in our neighborhood when they built the houses that it was a good idea to put barberry everywhere. And it's a pretty plant. You know, the Japanese barberry, it's a pretty plant, has berries, it has nice color and everything. It harbors ticks too. I dug mine out. And I don't know how extensive the invasives are there, but you may have to have um, uh, a digging out party. Get in there and get all of it, you know, out. The roots are, if you've, if you've seen that, the roots are yellow. They're kind of a bright yellow. Um, I, I am saying that I'm the service project person and you are one of our counties so it might be something we think of getting together a group of wild ones to, to help you with so um yes why don't you send wild ones an email that's a really wonderful yes that's idea. a really good idea that would be a great service project getting that stuff out of there and it's hard to get out well, we're in the cat. I will say though that we have a our, an upcoming meeting that will decide our project. So we'll have to have that information by March 14th, actually. Okay. And and who is that? Deirdre Lord. Ah, Deirdre. Okay. Deirdre, I'm gonna send you my personal email too. Okay. And then um, Judy is expressing that Ernst Seeds in Meadville, Pennsylvania also has all native plants. And we have a note from, we have a note from Christy that uh, Wild Ones has an award-winning journal and it has a whole bunch of places for buying plants. Um, Susan is asking, we have black walnut trees in our yard, presents a problem with the nuts and leaves due to jug loan. Oh, yes. Well, there's the perennial, so to speak, question of what do you plant under um, black walnut? And it, yeah, the jug loan, of course, is designed to keep anything else away from it. Um, stones, anyway, I'm only half kidding, but but yeah, that yeah, I don't I don't know what to say about that. I mean, basically, nothing will grow under that. Um, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to post my email to everybody in the chat. Okay. Because um, then you can send me all of this great stuff you've talked about um, in terms of, you know, places to buy plants and see plants and that sort of thing. Um, why am I not seeing the every, everyone? There it is. Okay. So I'm going to put that again. My name is Marty Tumim. My first name is Marty, I-E at the end. And it's Marty Tumim with an M at the end at gmail.com it's m2mim at gmail.com and i just put it I'm trying to put it in 
There it is. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, there you go to everyone. Okay, so here's our next one. Are leaves great to leave for butterflies? Yes, because um, any of the, um, the butterfly caterpillars that are in there, they like to be under the leaves. It protects, see, see when we rake up all of our leaves and we get rid of our stems and everything, we're just sending off, if you have picked up by the road or something, you're just sending them off somewhere else and they, they may or may not even live through it. So leaving the leaves means that you are protecting the caterpillars underneath. Okay. And as someone, she's commenting, it's important to sign and label a garden of native plants to help educate your neighbors so they understand. Yep. And I heard that with Bokashi composting, you can put anything in it, even cheese and meat, as yep, long as it's not wet. Yes. And um, if you would send that to me, just send hey, me that yeah. name so I can do some research on that. And it's, it's, it, everybody should do research on that. I just saw a mention of it someplace, but I didn't really get into it. Um, okay. And we have, it's amazing how little garbage we have because most of our food, I'm a vegetarian, most of our food goes back to the compost heap. Um, it's amazing. And then where do we get mulch from? Can we use wood chips from tree services? Um, Jean, where are you from? I don't know. Um... That's not my next question, Marty. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I, I took over your spot. Sorry about that. I can if you'd okay. like to, but I'm with Joyce. Oh, where can I get information to identify invasive plants? Um, again, I would go to your local cooperative extension. Do, find out where that is if you don't already know. And usually you can find information online or by phone. And the other thing is your environmental conservation state body has information on that, what, what they consider invasive in your state and where in your state. Okay, and the next one is, what do you recommend to use to replace butterfly bush? I have a dwarf and a regular one. I would use something, I would use something else entirely like nine bark maybe, or um, there are some of the um, Ilex verticillatas that are good in terms of good looking. Um, the, the butterfly weed is really a plant um, versus the butterfly bush. Um, and it only grows to be, you know, maybe a foot and a half or two feet tall. But um, again, it depends on where you are too, what kind of shrubs um, will grow well there. Um, of course, the butterflies like things that bloom. Okay, Deidre says, thank you. Chris, perhaps leaves, uh, Chris comments, perhaps leave some areas mulch free. Many native bees need bare ground for nesting. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Wonderful idea. I will definitely follow up. Okay. Joe. Okay, but let me answer that one. Yes, you should have some, um, you should have a few places. I completely misspoke on that. Um, they say not to leave bare ground, but yes, you can you can kind of clear out a few spaces here and there where you know there will be ground bees. So make sure you 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 know you know where that area is, and it's probably not right up against your front door or something, because there will be bees there. But yes, you don't always leave your you know you don't always have to cover your ground. That's a very good point. Okay. So Joan says, I just re removed barberry from my backyard along with honeysuckle and forsythia. The ground I, I'm not, is not very, sorry, uh, we're missing some letters. Very disturbed by the backhoe that was needed. What should I do with the ground soil before trying to rewild? Ah. The ground, I think the ground was very disturbed by a backhoe. By the backhoe, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what should I do with yeah. the ground before I rewild? Yeah, I think um, what I would do is if it's completely open now, if it's just ground, if it's just soil, what I would do is I would get in there and I would just work in, you know, a little bit of manure, work in um, some compost and that sort of thing. Not a lot of manure because a lot of native plants like the soil lean. They don't like it super, you know, because they're used to growing wherever they can grow. Um, but I would work in some things there. If it if you need to loosen it up, you can work in a little bit of, um, oh, you know, 
uh, chopped leaves and that sort of thing, organic types of things. You know, if it's very if it's very flat and if the backhoe actually drove over it or something works, but it doesn't hurt to work stuff in anyway. Maybe you know what double digging is, where you dig dig out, uh, you know, about two feet of it and put it of the soil and put it in a in a pile, and then mix the next soil over into the hole with good stuff in it and just keep doing that, keep moving the soil over. And then what you took out, you mix with, amend it, you know, you amend it and put it in. That's called double digging, but that's pretty labor um, intensive. Okay. But I just work, I just work in some stuff, you know, not very deeply, but just work in some stuff. Give it a, give it a head start. Okay. Now, when cold composting, do you have to cover the top with hay and water it down after every bucket of scraps? And what about the winter? Do we have to cover it differently? From Kayla. No, I never carry my, cover mine. I don't top with hay and water it down. I just throw everything on the top of it and, and don't do anything to it. It'll, it'll figure it out. It'll start to decay underneath. It'll be, if you put your hand in there, I would put a glove on. Uh, if you put your hand in there, it'll be hot inside. So just keep doing this. Just keep adding stuff to the top. And once in a while, you can, you can turn it over a little bit. You can take a pitchfork or something. Um, if it's in a container, I have something that's, uh, if you know, it, oh, it's almost like an auger, but it's bigger and it's, it's um, electric and you, and you turn the soil with it. You put it in and it stirs it around almost like a, stirring whipped cream but anyway no I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything differently and you need the water in there you don't want to cover it okay well one just went away but anyhow it was uh it was from Chris reminding everybody that there's also a pollinator palooza uh plant sale coming up in June uh Chris if you're still here with us can you post maybe the link to more information for that for people uh, Judy says lots of plants survive under black walnuts, asters, blue lobelia. I didn't, I didn't know that they would survive under that. And so that's well worth researching again, you know, what, what, uh, plants survive under black walnut. Okay. Um, and those are native plants. Mm -hmm. And Judy, thanks for a great presentation, Marty, from a 22 year Penn State master gardener. Ah. 6B. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Kayla has a ton of rabbits in her neighborhood. What are some good natives to have for them to eat? <laughs> okay. It's it's help it's helping me to read it too. Now just a oh, minute. Okay. Who sent that one? Oh, hi Jen. Kayla Miller, yeah. Okay. Okay, epic gardening. Great. So that's the one she's talking about. We have a ton of rabbits in our neighborhood. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what are some good natives to have? Ah. To eat? Well, see, the problem is deer and rabbits and squirrels and chipmunks, they all grew up with native plants. So they like native plants. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, ton of rabbits. I don't know what to say. I don't kill things. Um, you just have to kind of fight them for it. Um, fence in anything you can with fence that goes way down in the ground. Um, otherwise, it's a crapshoot. It's just Marty. you're just fighting with the animals. Marty, what? yeah. Um, they say that planting clover in in your lawn will help uh, keep the rabbits in the lawn and out of your beds. Is that Sue Gutman? Yes. Yeah, I recognize your voice. Um, that's a good idea. You know, if you give them what they like, maybe they'll stay away from the other things that you don't want them to eat. Yeah, that, um, sorry, that's that's what we plan on doing. Our front yard, we're going to turn into like a native pollinator kind of habitat type, oh, type of thing. Yeah, and so I was asking like, what are some things that these rabbits can have to eat like in spring, summer, but also like in the winter, like we've been scavenging for food around our house and I don't have any food for them. So um, going back to the black walnut for a second, Victoria put in, uh, if you look in the chat, um, there's a link to prairienursery.com, um, black walnut tolerant. So that's a good thing to use. 
But anyway, back to now, Sue, first of all, um, we just exist with the bunnies, you know, but you can use something. There are things like hinder and other things that you can put on plants um, if you want to use those things um, that will keep deer and rabbits and things away. Um, you have to look on it. It can get to be pretty expensive. You need to buy the one that is not diluted already and just dilute it yourself. You save money that way. And then you put it, but if it rains, you have to put it on again, um, but it will keep them from eating it. And the other advice is whatever you don't want them to eat, start really early in the spring before things come up. Because as soon as things come up, they're gonna start eating them down to the ground. So you know where your plants are and you um, put it on the ground and that will make them make other plans for where they're gonna have their dinner. Um, Sue Gutman asked about butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is very nutritious for butterflies. It's the butterfly bush that is not. The butterfly bush with the, the big bush with the big purple flowers is not. Right, thank you for clarifying. The Asclepius that. tuberosa is good for them, okay. Okay, sorry, Rosemary, where were okay. you? Where do we get mulch from? Can we use wood chips from tree services? Yes. Okay, Jill Gardner podcast had a wonderful episode about Bokashi. So oh, good podcast is something to look up if you're interested there then we have options for black walnut um, yeah. um again should we use wood chips from tree services yes did you say butter nope we're done with that one right the butterfly weed is good yeah okay and then kevin from epic gardening has a ton of great gardening information uh kevin is spirit too and, and kayla's listed that and jen uh, they're talking about under black walnut trees that there are some that do grow. Um, Sue got is asking about nutritious nectar for pollinators. I don't know what that's in reference to. Yeah, uh, I don't know. See, that's I, I broke up my own message. It, it was in um, relation to uh, butterfly bush and butterfly weed. Okay. I explained that. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No, perfect. Marty, thank you for your time and information. Do many towns and villages have regulations and ordinances on public um, areas of your property? Yes. Okay. And relations. Hmm. And that's to everyone. And I think, you know, we are lucky. I live in the town of Bethlehem, New York. And, um, our town supervisor used to work for the Nature Conservancy. So we're getting a lot of good work done while he's in office. And I don't know what's gonna happen when we lose him. But um, yes, towns and villages have ordinances. Homeowners associations have ordinances. Um, Wild Ones presented something that was um, by a lawyer and she talked about um, what, you know, what to do with your towns and homeowners associations and what to do if you get some kind of a, a letter saying that you have, um, you have to take out a garden because it goes against one of the ordinances. Um, I think that's, if you go to Wild Ones, I think we have that up, don't we? Yes. Our past webinars. Yes, that'll be there. That's a wonderful one. Okay. Have you heard about using copper nails into invasive trees and vines to kill the plant? If I yes, have you heard if it creates toxicity in the soil? I have, I've never heard of that. Okay. Something to look, you know, look at. I'm... Okay, Me Gardener also has a ton of great information. Where can we get worms to add to compost? Bait shops? I would look online. Um, and again, I know we have vermicomposting, worm composting up at the Cooperative Extension. And so your Cooperative Extension may know or you can call a garden center. Um, they're not the same, necessarily the same kind of worms they use as bait. So you really have to have to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay. And then Zoom three, if you go to Capital Region, um, Wild Ones Organic Events Calendar, we do have uh, further information about the pollinator perlusa up there. Uh, so you can take, uh, someone suggests clover for rabbits in the turf. Um, 
Sunday, June 4th for the plant sale. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot. Red worms are good for vermicomposting. So are you on the compost crew? I, I'm not, but I've done vermicomposting with students and, okay. and I ordered red worms online. <laughs> um, not very expensive. You can get hundreds of them and uh, they, they seem to be the ones that they recommend if you want to create your own uh, compost. Okay, so Jen that has corrected to instead of red worms, she's saying red wigglers. Oh, that might okay, be good. True. Okay, in a while. <laughs> All righty then. Jim's Worm Farm. Where's that? Uh, let's see if it comes up. I think at this point, people can unmute if they want to make a comment. Yeah, Jim's Worm Farm is, um, it's an online. I've ordered, ordered okay. before. So you get your worms in the mail. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Happy day. <laughs> okay. Great information, Marty. Thank you. And really, welcome. really love that the handout's so available and all the links are so available. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. Yes. Okay. Marty, good job. Thanks, Jan. All right. Okay, signing off. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh. Thank you.